So I'm going to do some fact checking with all of you. So let's see if you knew all these things. If you are an adult of average weight, here is what your body will accomplish in 24 hours. You ready for this? You will eat about 3.25 pounds of food. You will drink 2.9 quarts of liquids. You'll lose 7 8 pounds of waste. Gross. You will speak 4,800 words on average, including some very unnecessary ones. You will move about 750 muscles. Your nails will grow, and I have no idea how they do this, but your nails will grow on average a point zero 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 four six inches of an inch, and your hair will grow a point zero one seven one fourth of an inch. You'll exercise about seven million brain cells, and your heartbeat will beat about 103,689 times. On average, your blood travels 168 million miles. And you breathe 23,040 times. And you inhale 438 cubic feet of air. And since we're talking about our bodies, did you know that the average human body is about 65% water, which leaves only about 20% of our body weight from our bones. Hmm. Speaking of bones, we heard the word this morning taken from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the poor prophet who was commissioned to prophesy to a valley of inanimate, long dried out, old and very dead bones. Can these bones live? God asks Ezekiel. And today God asks us the same question too. Let us think on these things. Let us pray together. Loving God, open our eyes to the beauty of your holiness. Open our ears to the message of your word. Open our hearts to the power of your love. Open our lives to the coming of your spirit, that we may truly worship you now and forever. Amen. Amen. This morning, our quartet, Michael, Andy, John, and Stephen, reminded us, or reminded me at least, of the Delta Rhythm Boys as they sang the well known traditional spiritual song used allegedly to teach basic anatomy to children, though the descriptions are not always anat anatomically correct. But the melody was written by African-American author and songwriter James Weldon Johnson. And of course, the lyrics are based on Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 4, where the prophet Ezekiel visits the valley of the dry bones and causes them bec to become alive by God's command. The picture on the front cover of your bulletin is from the wilderness of Zin in Israel, one of the places that we did not go during our pilgrimage, so I borrowed that one from Google. But the wilderness of Zin is also speculated to be the place of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And mysterious, it is still covered in round-shaped stones for miles in their vast desert. Now, the Sunday before Palm and Passion Sunday is often called Lazarus Sunday, as it is the gospel text that is used to prepare us for Christ's resurrection through the breathing of life back into Christ's friend, Lazarus of Bethany, found in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 45. How wild must it have been for those who were mourning Lazarus especially his sisters, Martha and Mary, and to have Jesus tell them, take away the stone. And to their revelation, Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And as they rolled away the stone, Jesus called the dead man out. Lazarus, come out. And as he came out with his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in cloth, I think he might have reminded us of a zombie or a mummy from antiquity. Yes, 
Jesus was preparing us for resurrection. But there were others before him that prophesied and prepared us as well. As we look back into the tradition of our Old Testament, Testament text, we encounter Ezekiel, born into a priestly family in about 623 BCE, and during the Babylonian exile, when he and his family were taken into captivity, Ezekiel was called, and I don't know how they know it was July 592 BC, but they say that at the age of 30, he was called to become a prophet of God. And as he begins his career of prophesying, Ezekiel is whisked away into his own encounters with Yahweh, the God of Israel, who rode upon chariot, a chariot of four wheels, guided by cherubs, and foretells the exiled people of Israel's fate and the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. And this fulfills the prophecies along with his contemporary Jeremiah, who was living at Jerusalem in the time, at that time. And the prophecy that was fulfilled was that Jerusalem was taken over by the Babylonians in 587 BCE. And the book of Ezekiel also takes us through the prophet's career as a 50-year-old, telling of his visions and promise of a new beginning and a new temple. Today, Ezekiel's prophecy brings us into the Valley of the Dry Bones. And boy, is it an odd story. And like Lazarus, our imagination comes right out of those zombie and mummy movies that we do watch. And when we think about it, how frightful must it have been for Ezekiel? And so we open this scene with the hand of the Lord coming upon Ezekiel and bringing him out of the spirit of the Lord and setting him right down in the middle of a valley. He was full of bones, just dropped right down. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones bleached by the sun. And then God said to Ezekiel, mortal, can these bones live? And this is how Ezekiel answered this rhetorical question. Oh, Lord God, you know. And perhaps it was a good thing that Ezekiel responded that way to that ridiculous question, which was appropriately ambiguous. The response may have been heard in several ways. God, only you know, since as far as I am concerned, dry bones are not going to pop up back to life. Or if they do, I would just as soon not be around to see it happen. Or he could have said, if you, God, ask a foolish question like that, then I give you the opportunity to answer, since in my experience, these dry bones are just dead. Life is inconsistent with dry bones. But Ezekiel didn't meddle. He let God answer the question which prompted the challenge to Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. Say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the God, Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he prophesied as he had been commanded. And as Ezekiel prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Freaky. If I had been Ezekiel, I would have been running the other way. Yet, as Ezekiel looked and saw that there were sinews on them, muscles and flesh and skin, they were not alive. There was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came to, into them, and they lived, 
and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Now we hear the word breath and breathe. In this part of the scriptures alone, we say God, we hear God say to Ezekiel to command breath eight times. Breath, the life-giving breath of God, the spirit of God. That's one of my favorite Hebrew words, hurucha, the breath of God. Now without this breath, these bones cannot live. Sure, they have come together with their toe bones connected to their foot bones and their foot bones connected to their ankle bones. But to live, the muscles and sinews need to be reattached. And yet still, it's not enough for those bones to live, for they need the breath of God, Ruha. And it is in Ruha that we are preparing for, particularly in this Lenten season, for God to give us new life. Yet sometimes we have to go through the valley of the dry bones first to recognize it. There are biblical commentators who may have glimpsed the resurrection in this prophecy, but what is more pertinent to theologian and Perkins School of Theology homiletics professor John C. Holbert is the question, just what is the prophet's specific role in this rebirth? And just what has God to do with it all? In the following four verses after the bones are resurrected by the breath of God, Ezekiel tells us what this bizarre image means. He's mortal, these are the bones of the whole house of Israel. And the story is an extended metaphor. The bones are in fact the people of Israel, the dejected and the defeated exiles in Babylon. And they cry back to him, our bones are dried up and our hope, our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. And after the first defeat of Israel and Jerusalem by the forces of Babylon, the initial waves of exiles were marched eastward to the fable capital of the Babylonian Empire. And it is often thought that Ezekiel was among them. The shock of their defeat led them to absolute despair and hopelessness. But as Holbert reflects, Ezekiel has good news for these exiles. For a third time, he is asked to prophesy that the hearers are not bones or wind, but that they are his people. Thus says God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And the metaphor shifts from bones to graves, but the meaning remains the same. There is still hope. Even though the people find themselves far from their home, landless, kingless, without a temple or a priest, even in exile, Yahweh is not forgotten. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil, and you shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken and will act, says Yahweh. Now, I am a believer that the word of God is inspired and that as our prophets prophesy, we are given imagery to help us make real the word. And sometimes our imagination and imagery of God and the word can be quite scary. But in thinking about the context of this time, Ezekiel was sharing for the people what they desperately needed. Hope a metaphor, a simile, an illusion for the people to hear the word of God that in death and struggles there is still hope and that the spirit will be within us. This does not mean that them old dry bones would come back to life literally, but that life would be returned to them in spirit. In this breathing back life into the dead, dead things or things that are struggling just barely to hold on. This Wednesday, we will be celebrating our Christian version of Seder, of a Seder meal, with my dear friend Rabbi Jonathan Klein and his 11-year-old son, Rachmael. His name is Rocky for short. As we are celebrating our Christian tradition in entering Holy Week, 
So much of our focus is on death and dying. But we do need to get through these things to get to the resurrection. But for those who practice Judaism and the Jewish faith, Passover is a reminder of bringing life and breath into the traditions and rituals that are taught and carried on from generation to generation. It is in the stories and trials and struggles that honor is brought back to their ancestors, who may be them dry bones in the desert. And it is in that honor that life lives anew. In our hearts and our prayers, we are still very much thinking about the Japan earthquake and tsunami, with a death toll that has risen to 13,000. In the grief and loss of so many lives, lives that we know will not be brought back from the dead, but in those stories of tragedy and sadness, we are also reminded that life can begin anew. One of my friends who is a student studying at the Claremont School of Theology shared this story with me. Kenji was one of the rare Japanese Christians in his neighborhood, or Japan for that matter. And although many of his own friends were Buddhist, and it was a good place to start arguments and conversations, though most of those arguments were centered around cars, food, sports, and every now and then a quick joke about Kenji's thick glasses, as his name was his nickname was Four Eyes. Kenji was working on a senior project for high school, and he had spent the last two weeks in his parents' basement staring at the computer screen, getting ready for one of the biggest presentations of his life. Other than the fluorescent lights on the ceiling, there was a stream of light coming in from the small basement that was no lo the window was no bigger than a sheet of paper. However, during this time that he was doing his homework, he powered on his computer and logged onto the screen, and the computer began to shake furiously. In fact, the whole house began to shake violently. The ceiling lights began to surge, and the shelves of the books and photo albums began to crash on the ground. And the room began to shake harder and harder, and Kenji couldn't even stand it anymore. And realizing that he wouldn't make it out of the house, he wedged himself in between the couch and the wall, hoping that he wouldn't be permanently injured by falling objects. Whole bookshelves began to fall and pinned him to the ground, and what he believed would have been a safe place became a trap that wouldn't let him go. Only half a minute had gone by now, and as the ceiling began to fall, adding to the pile of rubble, they knocked his glasses off and the weight began to press against his abdomen, causing him to only take short breaths of life. Although he wasn't wearing his glasses anymore, he could see the blur of a small basement window being overtaken by unfamiliar darkness. Kenji could only hear the roar of the ground tearing and buildings collapsing, and the ground shaking felt like it would never end. Although the earthquake stopped after 90 seconds, it felt like it was an eternity. What had just filled the room with sounds of destruction, violence, demolition, and sheer carnage became muffled sounds of car alarms, barking dogs, and people screaming for help. Struggling to be free, Kenji was able to wiggle his right arm and even managed to free his phone from his pocket. But he could barely make out the words on his phone without his glasses. Battery life, 75%. Signal strength, 0%. So he turned off his phone, not knowing when or how long he would be stuck between the couch, the wall, and the bookshelf. He became trapped for hours, or at least it seemed like that because he had no clue what time it was. He couldn't see the sunlight because the window was barricaded, and he was too afraid to waste his cell phone battery. And he couldn't yell because of the immense weight of the on his chest from the debris. So Kenji just laid there on the cold floor and closed his eyes. And when he did close his eyes, Kenji began to feel the internal realities of his situation, but in the manner that a high school senior would probably assess their situation. He began to ponder thoughts like, I hope I will be able to do my presentation late. And I think that my teacher would understand what happened. And then this turned to other thoughts like, I wonder if my teacher is okay. 
I wonder if my friends are okay. Come to think of it, I wonder if my school is still standing. Wait, where's my mom and my dad? They were supposed to be home by now from grocery shopping. And as Kenji began to move towards the realization that he had no idea where his family was, he began to weep. For at that moment, there was nowhere he felt safe, not even in his mind. And as his breathing became labored, he regained his composure after some time, and he closed his eyes and practiced and concentrated on breathing, and he prayed to God. He found some comfort in praying and was able to wipe his eyes and get some rest. However, for the next 48 hours, Kenji would have to revisit the same harsh realities in his cold, dark basement. By this time, he had become weak from not being able to eat or drink, and what began as a searing pain from the weight of the couch, the wall and the bookshelf, became agonizing to just breathe. <laughs> Realizing that he may not have much energy later on, he turned on his phone. Signal strength, 25%. Battery level, 10%. So he sent a text message to his mother, his father, his friends, and his neighbors, and as many members, people that he knew. And the message read, I am alive, but trapped in my basement. I need help now. When the message was sent, his phone completely died, and it seemed useless. So he closed his eyes and prayed again. Another hour had passed before Kenji realized that he heard the sound of muffled voices, not screams or crying, but familiar voices. Although his eyes were still closed, he could see the light from the basement where the window should be. But he couldn't open his eyes because he was too tired. But he felt people lifting the shelf and the couch, and he could now breathe. But it was still unbearable but he felt his body float up as though he were lifted out of the basement window. He was free. And the next time that he opened his eyes, Kenji was surrounded by white, white linens, white bedsheets, white walls, nurses and doctors dressed in white, and white-tinted fluorescent lights. He noticed the sun shining through the hospital window and realized that everything was clear. Someone had put his glasses back on his face. And he also noticed that he could breathe again. It was still painful, but to breathe deeply, inhaling the clean, fresh air that smelled so good and that made his lungs come alive and want more. A breath of life. Ruha. God surprises each of us with life. When we can only see death, we are challenged when we hear stories of drive-by shootings and suicide bombers, we think about piles of bones that we find in our own deserts on the borders of Mexico. Perhaps it is absurd to think that this day and age of the metaphor that Ezekiel prophesied and that 1,000 Judeans would be raised up again. But are there times in our own lives that we have, that we're gasping for air, that we're trying to breathe? What does it mean for us to be truly resurrected and to be resurrection people? It's about, res it's about breathing new life into places that were once dead. A wonderful living example that I would invite all of you to visit is the Aldersgate Room, upstairs above our church offices. Once upon a time, it was vibrant with life, but as rooms get old and there needs need to be tending to, the walls, the paint started chipping off the walls, the carpet was stained and torn. But with much thanks to the trustees and our young adult ministries, we see what has come from the peeling of paint and removing of old carpets, a life-giving room with a new breath of ministries right here in our own church. And as Dr. Holbert says, so it is for us on this fifth Sunday of Lent in our Lenten journey, though we may see, often see ourselves as dry bones, without breath, hopeless and despairing, as good as dead, lying in our graves, we need to listen to the prophets among us 
who continue to hear the absurd call to prophesy to us bones, to proclaim that our self-imposed graves cannot hold us, that God is among us and is a God of life and hope now and forever. Where are the places and who are the people in our communities where we can breathe God's ruha into it? Let us be mindful of the breath of God, breathing in and through all our lives. Amen. <laughs>